So we have um, been recording uh, some talks that were going in the opposite direction because when we began this, we started with death and dying. And then we looked at what happens just before that with Bawa, how it pushes the action uh, to into the, the birth. I'm sorry, the birth came before that. And then the Bawa comes before that. So you had Jati, then Bawa. And then you had um, the Upadana, the clean, which we talked about last week. And this time, what we're looking at is we're going to go look at craving. And um, I want you to, um, you know, in the old, when we, number of years ago, we didn't really quite emphasize it, but now it's happening that we bring out something very important that's happening with craving. Each time you get to that craving link, something important on the line of cognition is happening. And we, we really want to note that. We want to understand that, how, how that's happening, where it's, where it's coming from. And most of all about craving, we want to discover that there was a symptom as you'll find out in just when we go through this. So let's look at that and see what that means for us when we are, when we are doing our, um, um, our practice for the escape and we're using it in daily life. And we'll talk about that too. Okay. Okay. So my goodness, look at all the stuff. <laughs> it's really interesting. Okay, let me see where this is. Here we go. Okay. I thought I closed a lot of that. I guess I just left it hanging. There's been a lot of interaction around here lately. So, okay, when we go into this, I'm going to go back to the beginning of this and um, where once it was short, <laughs> now it's getting a little longer, but that's okay. It has a little bit more meat in it. And so this is the foundation series for 2021. And we're saying, what is craving link? <clears throat> so I, I think that I told you that one of the things Tranquil Wisdom and in Insight Meditation, TWIM does, is that it tries to develop easier definitions for people. So they can remember uh, the definition. And that's so that it can help you your in, during your meditation. But to use it in every part of it in your daily life, you have to have this symptom if you're going to keep training the mind. Now, this is the part that might be rewritten still a little bit because they really, really confirmed in their research on the brain about how a brain is um, trained, how it is um, for the best operation for awareness and things like that, how you can change uh, bad habits that you have and all the research that was done on that in the last like 10 or 11 years. If you go back and look, they make a big deal out of the fact that they are proving once and for all that um, the brain learns by repetitious practice. Repetition in exactly the same way. It's like if you keep tapping the new behavior, it will replace the old behavior. And it, the, they call it the neural pathways in the brain that are carrying these old habits will shrivel up and dry up and die. And they know this from the new kinds of MRIs that they can do uh, on people. The cameras are so powerful. They can see where the pathways actually are. And then they can see the new one coming, starting, the new path starting to take hold and the old one being neglected from lack of personal use or personal use with it. And the more, the less personal attention it gets, that pattern fades out and dies. It basically drives up and it drops off. And the old one is there after a number of months of working on the new one. So they have this down pat. They know this is real. So one of the things that interested me about reading the articles about this was that, well, that means nobody can rightfully say May is stuck. <laughs> you can't say I'm stuck. None of us are actually stuck in the mud and we can't get the vehicle out 
unless we have boards or stuck in the snow, unless we have salt and gravel and boards to roll the tire up on to get it going, it's not that way anymore, is no excuse. What is true is the older you get, the larger that pattern, the more firm it can be in your brain, it's true. So, but the method, the practical, actual method of changing the behavioral pattern from the old one to the new one is absolutely established. So then it becomes how willing are you to work on change? This is why Bhante always told me the thing about Buddhism is Buddhism is about change. So when you come to the Buddhist practice, the original idea was, are you willing to change? Because that his original practice really changes people. So the reason is that the meditation, uh, the reason that we were um, helping your meditation and using it in every part of daily life, the reason is that meditation was life as it, um, as it was originally used at that time. And it turned out that life is meditation. Life can be changed through meditation. But the meditation is not just formal meditation. The meditation is not just sitting. It's not just in a formal group or retreat or by the teacher. It's when you do it all the time for the extreme repetition on the brain that things really, really start to change and take hold. That's the most important part. And it's fun. <laughs> so after contact happens in the line of human cognition, you get to the cognitive link of feeling. And um, when feeling as with feeling as condition, craving arises. And this is an important link to remember because it is the first real boost in energy forward along the line of links when it is moving towards suffering, okay? Because of this, it's the most important one to have a clear idea what happens here with this link. What is happening? Because if you remember the charts I gave you with the 12 links, the green links, those were up to, um, up to the six sense doors. It was anatomically part of the human body functions. I don't make any of the things behind that line actually happen, okay? And the I in this life doesn't do that. So when we ask what is craving, we have to start there. In the past, uh, we have most often heard the short reply of one word just spoken back to us. It's desire. And they walk away. Lots of times big teachers will just walk away. It's desire. And today, the Pali word most often chosen for desire is chanda. And that's kind of a bad rap for the word chanda because chanda, I'm sorry, I need another A here. The chanda can be used with two meanings. The words in Pali, many times they're like this. It can be used with two meanings. Boy, when you get to some of those words, they have a hundred different ways of using them. But this, are, many words are set up with two opposite sides. And this one has two meanings, Q says. And I say yes, because probably you have acted in your life through this word, Chanda, yourself, when you pursued a wholesome desire for something in life. But depending on the situation, Chanda can be meaning an unwholesome desire instead. Obviously, all of us fully uh, fulfill pursuing wholesome desire when we follow our precepts, keep practicing regularly, become successful as a family, get good grades at school, be successful in projects that help others in the community. It's a flexible word uh, based on how we find it used. But let's keep the uh, the wholesome going because desire involves involved with sense pleasures or pursuits that break the precepts are unwholesome and still 
we we um, we find that word is there. As you begin your training, it's just super important that you stay in a wholesome desired direction in your thinking, your speaking, and physical actions. We heard this in the precepts. We heard it in other places, and this is another place we're going to talk about this. So he says, but what about your meditation? Well, let go of craving. I need more information about what it is, how to see it clearly, how to let it go. It is the main root of all the suffering. I need to know why this is so and what kinds of symptoms arise when craving shows up so I can let go of it and replace it, don't you think? I mean, if, I, if you don't tell me what it is, you don't tell me how it, where it's going to come up, you don't tell me how it feels when it comes up or, at all, you don't tell me where there's a, some kind of a symptom I can point to, how can I let go of it? It's pretty simple. It's very basic. And he says, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, he says, absolutely. <laughs> like this. I think, first, it's a good idea for me to tell you more precisely what it is so that you will know, uh, know it when it shows up. So it's in refining the teaching of TWIM over the past 20 years or so, more people, just so more people could understand it. Bhante Vimla Ramsey worked pretty hard, really, testing and trying different things to come up with simple descriptive definitions that you can remember and repeat to yourself. And in that definition, as you repeat it to yourself, it tells you the symptoms of a rising craving. The one that we finally figured out this helps you stay in touch with exactly what this estate is like and how it happens. So his definition for craving or tanha boils down to this. Craving always manifests. That just means comes up as tension and tightness arising in mind and in body. It is the I like it or the I, like, I don't like it mind. See, right there, you hear what it feels like in that definition as it is coming up and something new that is happening in the line of cognition that was not born before, wasn't happening before. Craving has a sensation that changes in your mind and body. And as it arises, there is a change in the level of tension and tightness that you need to witness and uh, that gives the craving away. And as it is happening, you feel a stronger personal urge to grasp onto whatever is the object point of the craving in whatever situation it is, something you saw, heard, touched, felt, anything. And um, the I, the, the secret here is he's, Q is asking, well, what changed in this line? And what we didn't talk about before so much is this. Ah, uh, yes, I said, yeah, the I is born. And Dr. Pointy points to this very clearly. Where is I born? And the I is born here, as one says to oneself, I like this mind. I want, want it mind. And a current currently moves into action, moving towards attachment down the line of whatever's going on. Or it could be an I don't like it mind, I don't want it mind, and a current pulling away from what came up moves towards more forceful desire for aversion. Now, either way, upon arriving, craving signals mind through the degree and direction of the tension and tightness in the mind. See, that's your cue to let go and relax, smile, and come back. That's the cue. And that's not where the, the um, you know, this guy belongs, going back where you belong. <laughs> okay, so here we go. The student is trained to notice these signals that tell them their body and mind slightly changed following the arrival of feeling. Something happens at this point because once we know what this is, 
uh, then mind begins to calm down a tiny step. Even if you notice the tension, it even drops just a tiny bit. It slows down in the burst of wanting to go forward. It just it stops jumping around and we must escape before it grows stronger. That's your objective. You want to you want to operate the six R's. Gradually, with the practice, um, fine-tuning, what with practicing, we practice fine-tuning your observation. You, you begin to detect the change in tension and tightness earlier and earlier, and the student trains mind persistently to recognize and then release, relax, and smile as you continue the six R escape cycle. And you must remember the six R's um, each time. You have to remember them and do them all together. And the, tell you this just a second here. Yes, I try to keep them going now. That's good cue. The Buddhist meditation practice is actually a mind yoga. It is a mind yoga. Why? Because we let go of the concept of paying attention to every part of the body. We let go of um, paying attention to what's moving. And we go beyond that to say, while something is moving or we're doing something, what's happening in our mind? We go back to the control center. We go to the highest point of the whole operation of the suffering, which is what happens. Mind is the forerunner of all states. So he says, knowing that he goes back to the mind before anything else comes to happen in the body. And this is why we're, it, this is the basic, the, the guts of the Nama Rupa discovery mind-body connection, because there are all different ways to look and listen and write about Nama Rupa, but this is the real heart of it, is from mind flows everything. So we're just paying attention now here. We left it out for many years in calisthenics, and we said the body starts here and it goes down. <laughs> so now the Buddha comes along and says, no, you, you got it wrong. You need to be paying attention to the whole thing up here first, and then this will all follow. And that was the connection that made the difference for him to be able to go in to cessation, in my opinion. That's what I see happening with the students. So one of the things, um, I'll keep going here until I get to a little ditty. There's a little mark here. He tries to keep it going. So Buddhist meditation is actually a mind yoga. It trains us at the highest level to observe how mind's attention moves from one object to another. It, this is very important to train your awareness to see how everything is working. So notice what happens first. He wants you to notice what happens second. And this is what holds the secret of heavy or light suffering if you're familiar with watching how everything works. And although this is the weakest link in the line of human cognition, which is true, it'll be the last link to totally go away. It never stops until you reach the Arahat ship. That's where it totally is gone, which makes it interesting. But it is a key to understanding that what we need to do is we need to get out of the way and just use observation, which is mindfulness that is an observation, a skilled form of observation that just witnesses with no judgment, no judgment at all, no assumptions, no comparisons, nothing personal, it just observing. So you notice what happens first, what happens second, and then that holds the secret to, once again, the heavy or the light suffering. Although this is the weakest link in the line, we have to always remember it's the last one to go away. So don't be fighting to make it go away right now. That's a key to this thing. Doing that is just like the person, it's about as effective as if you just say, okay, I'm just gonna stop craving. It's just as effective as saying, okay, feeling came before that. So I just won't feel anything anymore. There, I'm done. <laughs> it doesn't work, you see? One person said when I was trying to explain about the changing of a habit, you see, um, I said, you know, when we're practicing right effort correctly. And this person was a very good meditator and 25 years into it, you know, and breathing meditation. But he just thought that we should get rid of 
all habits completely. That's true for the Arahat. Let's, this is one of these things. It's true for the Arahat, but it's not correct to say, well, what I'm going to do is not have any habits at all. Human beings can't do that. And you do form habits in that you will keep patterns of behavior, pre keeping the precepts, being kind, having compassion, all these things are part of living life from the result of your practice. So the objective was never, again, to stop the, the brain from thinking anything. That can't be done. So these were illogical jumps. Why? Why do they keep happening in modern times? Why do we hear this happening? Because you are mall people. <laughs> mall people. People who go to the malls and shop in industrialized nations, they expect to get everything they want when they go. Instant gratification. That's what they expect in their life. Everything to be instantly solved. And this takes a little bit of work not to make something happen, but to let go of everything. It's a new idea that the Buddha came along with. Just let go. Let go and see what happens. But as a result in your living, when you step back to your conventional living, you're not working in the ultimate discovery mode of the ultimate reality. When you live your life in the conventional reality with everyone else, of course you have behavior patterns. Of course you have habits of the way you do things. Someone's habitually mean and nasty and angry. And another one is habitually kind and gentle and helpful. So which one do you want to be? So you're working in trying to, it's part of the reason this happens is because we took it all apart and we didn't leave it woven together when we present it. In my opinion, that's part of the reason this all happens in a funny way. But if we had kept it woven together as we're teaching it, maybe this wouldn't have come, things like that wouldn't happen for people so much. As your mind's awareness grows, as the tension level shifts, when the tension sh level shifts, um, this gives a student a signal to release and relax and falls into the flow of all of the six R's. And